teachers who have struggled with this relatively abstract uh, physical concept of heat transfer and heat storage as we can see a lot of this is all um, equations processes which are invisible nobody can really see molecules vibrating so how does a teacher try to explain these concepts in a manner that it becomes part of the muscle memory of the student here are some recommendations for teaching aids which can be used by teachers of architecture or uh, air conditioning engineering. One interesting way to create muscle memory or experiential wisdom about different kinds of heat transfer is to experience different surfaces or different methods of sleeping which were available in uh, traditional homes for example. This might be difficult to, to pull off in a conventional urban home but something as simple as sleeping on the floor, a cool floor versus sleeping on a cot right, which has air uh, or holes in this to allow for movement of air. This process of keeping the body cool while you're sleeping relies on the process of conduction of heat. This one involves a process of convection so the air actually moves away from the lower part carrying the body heat away and is replaced by cooler air. This is convection. This is also a form of convection. This is a swing. Here you as an object are moving through a fluid. For all intents and purposes this is the same as this kind of convection because what is important is the relative movement of the objects in a fluid. This one is essentially a cot but the cot in this case would be exposed to solar radiation if it was out in the open. This is a cot under the influence of a shade. This would promote convection but at the same time inhibit radiant heat transfer. Here are some animations that you could use. These are available as links in the presentations that are available to the teachers.
softwares can be also used to create some amount of, of uh, not, I wouldn't say muscle memory, but certainly activate uh, other intellectual processes of the child to understand how different kinds of heating processes can benefit a building. For example, in this case, this is a software simulation of shading devices. As you can see, in each of the windows, there is a horizontal projection. Also, the neighboring buildings here actually have an influence of shading different facades of the building. So simulation softwares can be an effective teaching aid as well, in addition to other physical, more sort of kinetic and kinesthetic teaching uh, processes. Here is a very simple way of experiencing conduction in our day-to-day -day lives. We often do experience it, though we do, are not cognitively aware that what we are experiencing in this case is conduction. So this is uh, a person standing on a coir mat, uh, where one leg on the coir mat and one leg on a traditional stone flooring, for example. This is a mosaic tile. This leg is under the influence of an insulating process that operates between the, the tile and the person's foot. There are air pockets inside this, this coir mat which reduce the amount of, of heat gain, for example, if the surface was hot. Of course, it also means that less heat transfers from the body as well. In a cold uh, uh, nighttime condition, for example, this surface would feel warmer to the touch because the body will not be able to get rid of its heat through conduction because of the insulation of this layer. In this case, the body will very readily lose its heat to the stone flooring and feel cool. So this is a way of understanding conduction in a very experiential way. This is an experiment that could be conducted out in the open in a college on the, on the rooftop or in a compound. This here indicates how air can be a very good non-conductor or, or an insulator for beneficial purposes. So let's look at what this experiment is. This is a tube of a, of a vehicle tire, it, this could be a car tire for example, uh, and this is filled with, with air. Inside this cavity is a, a vessel which has something being cooked in it and on top of that we placed a sheet of glass or fiberglass or plexiglass, something that is transparent and allows solar radiation to come right through. If there was just this cooker and say a box with solar uh, or a transparent surface on top, it would cook this object here through solar radiation. Of course, that would be a very good use of renewable energy. However, if the surface around, say, if was a conducting metal, say if it was an aluminum box with a glass surface on top, the solar radiation would definitely come in, a part of it would be used to cook it, but because the surface would be a conducting surface, a lot of heat would be lost there as well because of conduction and then subsequent radiation. What this contraption is trying to do is it is trying to inhibit that loss of heat which has been absorbed so cleverly by providing this plexiglass surface for instance because air is a good insulator of heat. What it also very cleverly does is even if convection currents are set up inside this tubing, the convection currents are not allowed to take heat away from that region because it is a closed loop. So this one single experiment can be used to convey principles of radiation, convection and the, the prevention of heat loss through insulation. Here is a very simple way to convey the experience of convection. This is a common household hair dryer. And the movement of air is the method through which a person's face or their hair would be, would be uh, heated up or dried. So this is just using of a day-to-day -day device or gadget to experience convection. Again, something that, be, that can be carried in the classroom by the teacher uh, to start off a class which traditionally would be a dry technical subject. This is still a dry subject, but it is not just uh, uh, boring or insipid. This is an aid that can be constructed by students themselves to then be used in 
the process of conveying the uh, manifestation of convection in the context of a building. So the previous ones were sort of again looking at physical experiments, they weren't really real life cases of, of heat transfer. This here is a cutout or a, or a cardboard cutout of a, a room which has windows cut into it and it has a chimney. This is the glass window where solar radiation could be absorbed and there is also a window on this side. So there is cross ventilation that would happen if we were able to pull air from the chimney, right? the warm air rising. This um, physical teaching aid here uses candle lights and the smoke being generated from it as a way of tracing the movement of air through convection currents. So depending on the direction of the prevailing wind, say for example if there was a fan or some natural source of breeze blowing through this this cardboard uh, box, you would see that the smoke would actually rise through the chimney to a great extent and a little bit would come through the other side. This cements the idea uh, in the student's mind and experience that warm air rises very effectively and the provision of some sort of chimney in single story homes for instance could be a very effective way to bring convection into play as a way of cooling the building. This is a teaching aid which emphasizes the importance of the shape of a roof um, and how different shapes promote or inhibit convection currents from forming. So here is a certain quantity of water in a test tube and here is the same quantity of water in what's called a Chemex kettle. This has a very gentle and very elegant sort of slope that uh, is, is the, the, the part of the design of this, of this uh, Chemex kettle. The quantity of heat, if it's supplied, the same quantity of heat is supplied to both of these um, quantities of water because the shape on this side promotes the or actually helps proliferation of small convection currents that form. It is, they allow these, these convection currents to be amplified because of the, the kind of sloping nature of the, of the top and the bottom. This here would heat up this water very, very quickly compared to this, this shape of, uh, of the uh, vessel, which indicates that if you have buildings or rooms which have a curved ceiling, they would cool the occupants much faster because the warm air that is uh, present in the lower part of the room will rise very very rapidly to the top part and then can be evacuated through a chimney so on and so forth which is uh, can be verified this this kind of design has been very effectively used and can be verified by looking at traditional domed uh, heritage monuments where this principle has been used very effectively to keep the spaces cool this of course is not what is followed in most conventional rooms which have a very sort of uh, rectangular construction and are not able to take advantage of this this nature of uh, or this truth about how convection currents can be promoted. Here is a very uh, emphatic way of conveying the amount of radiant heat that is available to us to use uh, in an advantageous manner or also the amount of radiant heat that we have to battle when we are trying to cool spaces. So this is called a dashboard oven. It essentially is a, a way of conveying how the heat being trapped in a greenhouse situation. So this is a car which has, which has glass surfaces all you know, closed shut. And here, are, here is something that is being cooked in, in this case, say for example, cookies or some sort of dough. Leaving this in the presence of direct sunlight for a short period of time can achieve pretty significant temperatures and can be used as a way to cook uh, this, this raw material in this case, some, some sort of dough or cookies. And what this indicates is that most buildings that have a glass facade which is facing the sun actually creates an oven-like atmosphere, right? In this way, uh, in this case, they've, they've sort of uh, very creatively used that energy for a beneficial purpose. However, if we weren't using buildings to, to heat uh, uh, or create ovens out of, 
this would all be energy that would have to be battled by the air conditioner. So in conventional buildings, we should try and avoid the creation of this dashboard oven uh, situation. And this can be effectively conveyed to a student by conducting a dashboard oven exercise outside the classroom. Here are teaching aids which can be used to convey the idea of visual light transmittance. These are uh, glasses or, or goggles that can be worn by a student. This is a transparent set of goggles which will allow all the solar radiation to affect their eyes. Whereas this one is a tinted one. Uh, this tinted goggles will reduce what's called the VLT. Uh, but rather than just it, it being an abstract notion of VLT, the student can experience this by actually standing under the sun. Um, again, use of day-to-day -day experiences, but now becoming cognitively aware of the physics that is underlying this process. A, another way of indicating um, the physics behind day-to-day -day processes is to stand under the sun and wear a broad hat uh, or, or a hat with a, with a broad shade uh, around it. This is similar to what happens in the case of a window which has a horizontal projection above it. In a way, this horizontal projection is a hat for the window, just like this hat is shading the, the face of this person here. This again helps the students become cognitively aware of the solar heat gain that is being played around with by the use of a common day-to-day -day object. Here is a teaching aid which conveys the process of radiation and how it can be inhibited by placing of a screen in between the two objects to make sure that this, the, the occupant in this case, the building's occupant can be shielded from the effects of solar radiation. So this is a hot iron uh, pan and it's radiating heat, it's a dark surface so it has very high emissivity. This is a light colored screen and if you refer to the tables of the relative reflectance and emissivity of different kinds of finishes and colors, you can tell that this dark surface will emit a lot of radiation. Right? This is a light surface. The light surface, even if it is under the influence of radiation on, the, on this side, on the right side, will not convey much of it to the person on this side, which means it becomes a very effective radiation heat shield. This experiment uses the evaporation or what's called night flashing of water as well as radiation of water uh, and its heat energy to the night sky. This can be placed on rooftops in buildings where the nighttime temperature is relatively low compared to the daytime. So it can be done in a dry region for example and placing or doing thermometer measurements before you know the night commences right say at six o'clock when the sun is just going down, you can measure the temperature of the water and then come back the next day and you would see that the temperature of the water has dropped dramatically. So there are two processes at play here. One is the, the amount of cooling that happens because of latent heat of evaporation. But another one, even more uh, predominant, is the amount of cooling that happens because this is a warmer temperature than the sky temperature. So the radiation effect also cools this pail of water. These are small simple experiments that can be done by placing objects of different uh, curvature, different surface finishes, different colors under the sun and measuring the temperature of the surfaces either with a what's called an infrared thermometer or by, um, by a conventional mercury thermometer as well. As you can see the, the darker surfaces have a higher temperature which is uh, primarily because of the high absorptance and the low reflectance. The lighter surfaces have a lower temperature. Also the curvature matters. The more amount of surface area you are providing for radiation, not for solar heat gain, but for radiation, this reduces the surface temperature as well. So this can be um, conveyed quite effectively by conducting the experiment rather than just showing images to students. This is another experiment similar to the previous one which reiterates the relative uh, merits and demerits of using dark versus cool uh, or lighter colors for heating or cooling a building. Here is a jagged surface here which is a dark color 
this is the underside of this one is actually a light color like this. So this is just the same image flipped or the same object flipped around. And the surface, I mean, even though it looks different here, is actually the same, same surface. This is under the influence of air, which is at 35 degrees, right? Case A and case B are both under the influence of air at 35 degrees. However, because of the darkness of this surface versus this one, you can see that the radiant temperature is much lower here because of the high reflectance and the low emissivity of this kind of polished surface versus the dark surface. On the underside of this, this one has a polished surface, this one has a dark surface, right? Because this is essentially a flipped version of this. And you can tell that if you were to measure the temperature below, this one would have a very high radiant temperature on this side because it's dark, which means it has high emissivity. Whereas on this side, the underside is actually a polished surface. So it will have a low emissivity and hence the radiant temperature of the polished bottom surface will be lower in this case. Right? So these can again be used advantageously for the design of buildings as well and we, we will see that subsequently in sessions related to usage of these concepts to passively design your building. Here are small little models that you could construct out of brick, out of cement, etc. to explain different kinds of radiative cooling effects that can be beneficially used by allowing radiation from the rooftop to the night sky and thereby creating pockets of cool air on the rooftop in the building and using that cool denser air to descend down into the chamber or the, the place where uh, people will be um, occupying uh, the space uh, while sleeping, uh, for example. So these are methods of construction that were quite prevalent and ubiquitous in traditional architecture, but are of course, you know, gradually just depleting. Uh, this knowledge is depleting amongst modern building designers. If we can construct experiments to, to reintroduce these concepts to students, perhaps we will start seeing a manifestation of these things in the buildings that they design. So here is one option for conveying this concept, which is a flat roof where the, the top of the roof is radiating to the night sky. Here is a sloped roof where uh, we have an attic over here, which essentially becomes a storehouse of cool air. This cool air is allowed to descend into the lower space and the warm air rises, gets cooled here. So this becomes almost like a, a refrigeration compartment, which is constantly radiating heat to the night sky. And this becomes almost like a passive cooler for the building. This is a similarly, instead of, uh, if you don't have an attic, right? What you can do is you can create almost a, a mini attic by having a cloth that is hung from the tin roof in this case. And this becomes a pocket of cool air, which is constantly radiating heat through this tin surface into the night sky. And this cool air is then used inside the building. Radiation and thermal mass are very difficult concepts sometimes to, to grasp because they're so invisible. Here is a physical teaching aid that could be constructed to convey the concepts of thermal storage, which means how do objects store energy for a long period of time and thereby reduce the amount of heat gain that is happening inside the building? Or conversely, can we store the heat very effectively for long periods of time and then use that heat if usefully, say for example, to heat uh, people in cold climates. So this is what's called a candle room heater, a, a cup candle room heater, which has got small little tea light candles and has an earthen pot, which becomes the storehouse of all the convective heat that is coming in. However, that convective heat eventually gets absorbed by the molecules of this object, right? And gets stored right, because of the high thermal capacity of this material. Once the candles have been extinguished after a couple of hours, what is uh, sensed, and this can be verified through touch, through sensory mechanisms, or even through a thermometer, is that this object remains warm for a long period of time after the candles have been extinguished, which is an indicator of thermal storage capacity. And the way it heats the occupants around is through the process of radiation because even if there was no air available and there was a warm object 
at a distance from the occupants, they would feel the radiative heating effects of this candle cup heater. Here are uh, mathematical and physical exercises that can be done by students to calculate R and U values of different kinds of wall assemblies the, and comparing them with the energy conservation building code, looking at what are the different options for thick walls versus thin walls, so on and so forth. These are all, all available in the presentation, the resources, the links to it, uh, to the energy conservation building code, etc. are all available in uh, the presentation that is available on our platform. These are charts that can be uh, distributed to help students understand the R values, the resistance values of different kinds of, of walls and cavities, for example. This is a worked example which helps you calculate the U factor for an entire assembly, uh, which was dealt with conceptually earlier, but this is a elaborate calculation process which allows you to calculate a very accurate R value for the wall and helps you uh, compare that with the required values for uh, meeting energy conservation building code criteria etc. This is a U-value calculation for a roof assembly and how does one go about doing that. Right? So this is an elaboration of that process which you can go through with your students as part of a quiz or a, or a test that you can administer. Yes, this just takes the process further. Right. In an earlier part of our um, training, we had uh, dealt very briefly uh, at a very surface level with the, the conflicting uh, debates that are made by building designers about the virtues of thermal mass and using thick walls versus the embodied energy that it does contain and the embodied carbon that is involved in the creation of these thick walls versus the virtues of having thick walls to delay heat transfer. So this is a worked example or the series of steps one could undertake to determine whether on a life cycle basis it makes sense to have thick walls versus thin walls to reduce the amount of energy, net energy consumption of the building. So, what you would do to be able to answer this question or students to be able to answer this question for themselves is first calculate the increased embodied energy of the thick wall, estimate the reduced energy consumption due to high thermal mass, low U, U values, and then compare whether these demerits, which is increased and in embodied energy, are offset by the virtues or merits of having the thick wall and the reduced Q which is um, uh, then operating because of the low U values and, and we'll just get a little bit into the equations in the next couple of slides. Yeah. So this is a very good resource that helps you understand the embodied energy per meter square of area of different kinds of bricks for example RCC slabs. So for example if you were dealing with a one meter square of brick wall this would first help us understand okay by making it thicker, for example, or making it bigger, how much more embodied energy would I first need to put in? And then we will compare this increased embodied energy with the reduction of solar heat gain that happens because of the thick wall. Right. Uh, so this is a very comprehensive, uh, uh, exhaustive resource of a lot of Indian construction materials and their uh, embodied energy developed by the Auroville Earth Institute, which is available to you. Once you have calculated the increased embodied energy and now you need to compare it with the reduced Q or the heat that is being absorbed by the building, this equation here allows you to estimate just that and then one can compare the reduced Q with the increased embodied energy to make a wise decision about whether one should go with thick walls. So this equation here, which is the conduction heat equation, allows one to calculate the Q as a function of the U value which is now increased. So as we increase the thickness, the resistance has increased or the conductance has come down for the same amount of area and for the same amount of delta temperature. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying let me reduce the U but increase the embodied energy. And what we've often seen is that the reduction of the U because it is applicable for the entire life of the building, right? that wall exists for say decades, 20-30 years. 
we get the benefit of reduced U for a very very long period of time for the increased expenditure of embodied energy once at the construction stage. Uh, nonetheless, this is a very methodical and rational way of doing the assessment. In this case, it shows that the amount of heat that is being transmitted by one situation with a U value of 0.1 for example is 700 BTUs per hour. If the U value was lower, say if it was 0 0.5, 0 0.05 rather, this Q would be approximately 352 BTUs per hour. BTUs is just a way of conveying energy, right? What we would then do is multiply that BTU, lowered BTU per hour into the hours that this wall would now be uh, cooler for and thereby allow us to make a good life cycle decision by comparing it to the embodied energy of the material. Okay. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you. Thank you.